Hallelujah once again. We are always grateful to God for giving us life and giving us opportunity to meet Sunday after Sunday. And today also we are very grateful to God that he has brought us together to listen to his word. As we said last week, we started a series titled, Who Are You? And we looked at the first seven group of people. Today, we want to continue and look at the, another set of six. And then we can verify where we are. I believe that the Lord is touching you and opening your eyes. I pray that today, your life will not be the same. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, once again we come into your presence. We ask that your spirit will speak to us again. Speak to us in a language we will understand. Touch our lives where none can touch. Wake our spirits up. Give us the grace of resurrection. Open our eyes towards you. Make us better believers from today. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. As we read last week, we will go back to our base scripture, which is John chapter 1, reading from verse 19 to 28. John chapter 1, reading from verse 19 to 28. And there I read. Now, now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Amen. Hallelujah. As we said last week, this was at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus and where the Jewish leaders had sent a delegation to him to find out who he was because to them, his actions look as if he was the Christ. And remember that they were in a period where the Jews were earnestly looking for a redeemer because they were then having gone under the Greek rulership and having, having experienced the, the Maccabean revolt and, and been on their own for a hundred years, then came under the Roman rulership. And they know that their salvation was in the Messiah. And so they look at John and thought that by his deeds, he could be the Messiah. But John said, I am not. I am just the voice, a forerunner of the Messiah himself. Hallelujah. Now we stood on this last week to look at the people, some of the people who were in Jesus' surrounding during the time of his betrayal, his trial, his death, burial, and resurrection. And we had looked at the character of Judas. We had looked at the character of the Jewish leaders. We had also looked at Pilate, 
Then we also look at the Roman soldiers and the temple guards. We look at the crowd. We also look at the passers-by. Then we look at the other nine disciples. Today, we want to continue and look at other characters who were also around Jesus. And I'm, I have arranged it in such a way that I'm going to end with the one I thought was the best. Hallelujah. And you also realize that the, the group we discussed last week are the team that did not do t- too well. Today, in today's group, we'll see a group of people who have done better. In the first, in this group, is Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. In John chapter 3, we saw Nicodemus' encounter with Jesus. And it was to Nicodemus that Jesus said, Marvel not, I say unto you, you must be born again. And it was his interaction with Jesus that brought the concept of born again, where Jesus says that unless you are born again, you will not have a part in the kingdom. Now we were told in that scripture that Nicodemus had to come to Jesus in the night because he was afraid of the Jewish leaders. We did not hear of Joseph of Arimathea until Jesus' death on the cross. When the two of them went to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus to bury. But these two were Jewish leaders. They were Pharisees who had encountered Jesus in his life ministry, had listened to him, had believed him, but had been afraid to associate themselves with Jesus, you know, whilst he was alive. So apart from the encounter Nicodemus had, which was recorded, we never heard of him until when the game was almost over. When Jesus was dead then, then they surfaced. What do they want? His dead body. Who are you? Are you also looking for the dead body of Jesus to bury? Or you are ready to walk with Jesus whilst he is alive? You are ready to walk with Jesus even when he was going on trial? Are you ready to associate with Jesus even when it did not sound and look romantic? Now, for this group of people, they may be in the church. They may, they may believe some of the things, but are not ready to come forward to do anything. They read the Bible. They believe in their heart. When they read scripture, they understand. But they will not take up any responsibility in the church. They will not be Bible study leaders. They are just there. They come to church and go home. Come to church, they go home. Then one day, when everything is spoilt, then they'll come and try to gather the pieces. Bible says that when you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today, as you listen to me, if you are a secret lover of Jesus, come to the fore. Jesus says that those who are not ready to associate with him, Those who are shy of him, he will also be shy of them before his father. It's time to show that you are a believer. Oh yes, it's time to show that you are a believer. I used to share that when I was at Tech, I was reading a course in Hinduism. And when we go to class, my lecturer will talk in such a way that he will be putting Christians down. In all the discussion, you know, if, if, if you have been in a group like that and you are a true believer, you realize that every bad example that will be given will be about Christianity. Christianity is the most guilty religion 
in the world. Every funny joke is about Christians, particularly pastors. Every funny joke is about a pastor. So every day he will speak and put my religion down. Every day he will put my religion down. But usually after the lesson, we have inter-hall Christian fellowship meeting. So usually I'll carry my Bible to the class. And then one day, after he had bombarded us, and interestingly, as he is bombarding us, my colleagues, they'll be giggling. They'll be saying, hmm, <laughs> tell them. But they all go to church too. So that day, when we closed, and, I, and because of the things he, he was doing, I went to class with a bigger Bible so that it would be known that this is my position. So that day he had bombarded us so much. And then I carried my Bible and I started singing and was going to the fellowship meeting. Then one of my colleagues came and said, so you, all these things we are learning, you are still going to fellowship meeting? And I told him that for me, I was a Christian first before becoming a student. Now, those who were giggling, and they all go to church on Sunday, oh, they be like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Are you like them? How is your Christian life like? I pray for you that you will be better than Nicodemus. Say amen. amen. You'll be better than Joseph of Arimathea. Why didn't Nicodemus, a Jewish leader, and Joseph of Arimathea, who had the courage and had access. Look, they have both the access to Pilate. Why didn't they go to Pilate when it mattered most? When the high priest was making his charges, why didn't they go there because they had access? You will not waste time. You will not say tomorrow. You will do it today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The second group, I call them the criminals. The criminals that hung with Jesus on the cross. We're told that Jesus was hung between two robbers. One to the left, the other to the right. And the one to the left derided Jesus. He teased Jesus. He laughed at Jesus. If you are what you say you are, get down and get us also down. But we're told that the one on his right shut him down and said that, are you not ashamed that you and I are suffering the same fate with him who had committed no sin? And then he made a prayer. He said, Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And the Bible said Jesus told him, today you'll be in paradise with me. Hallelujah. So technically, after Jesus' death, the first person who entered the kingdom was a repented thief on the cross. You and I can take advantage. Now, what is the character of these two criminals? They were the people who had the last fellowship with Jesus before he died. They were at the point where Jesus was making his seven final declarations. They were at the place where Jesus was going to be transcribed from the flesh into the spirit. They were just a step away from the kingdom. Oh, hallelujah. They saw it all. They saw it all. They felt it all. In fact, they would understand Jesus' state more than any other group of people. Because for them, they were not observers or spectators. They were participators in the suffering. And so the opportunity was so clear. But one of them couldn't take advantage of it. I pray that when the opportunity is red hot in your life, you will take advantage of it. Oh, we'll shout hallelujah. When opportunity brings itself close, you will take advantage of it. 
as a pastor, I have seen over time, times that you organize pro a program that you see that it will benefit the church, the church members will not come. But if you just say, oh, shall we come and have a picnic? You see that everybody will rush there. I pray that God will open your eye. That in whatever circumstances, you'll be able to determine where Jesus is. And you will associate yourself with him. You know, it is very easy to become like the robber on the left. Because, you see, when you are suffering, eh, you need extra faith to look to God. Sometimes suffering and poverty can make you say some things. And that was what happened to the gentleman on the left. He was suffering, but he forgot that God is still God, even though God was not looking clear to him. Sometimes when trouble hits you, and you pray, and you cry to God, you think that God has traveled. But the days you think that God has traveled, He's close by you. Recently, in the event of this coronavirus, I listened to a documentary. And the newsmen were asking questions. And they were trying to question the prayers we have prayed. And ask whether God had not heard us. Our God has heard us. And we should not put up ourselves in the position of this robber who was on the left. But stand on the right. And look unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Oh, hallelujah. So you will be better. You will be better than the robber on the left. In fact, you will be, for any, for any other reason, like the robber on the right. You will say the right things. You will make the right decisions. And you will enter the kingdom of God without difficulty in Jesus' name. Amen. The next group are the two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus. Now, these two that were on the road of Emmaus and were talking about the events of, of over the weekend. And Jesus joined them and they said that the women among them came telling them stories which meant that they themselves did not believe. And they couldn't recognize Jesus until they got to mealtime. And Jesus prayed. Then their eye was open. Thank God they were saved because, of course, they had opportunity then to repent because Jesus was in their boat. Now, what is this character like? This character can happen to a pastor's wife. It can happen to a pastor's child. Or people who are in the environment of anointed people. They will walk with the man of God. They will walk with the woman of God. They will walk with the anointed person. They will walk with the gifted person. But can be veiled and they will not see whom they are walking with. These two traveled with Jesus. They traveled with Jesus. They conversed with Jesus, but they took Jesus like one of the ordinary person. It takes grace to sit beside an anointing and recognize it. Jesus' own brothers suffered the same. While Jesus was on earth, they didn't believe him. And they, they even added to his pain. At a point, they thought he was even mad. They later believed after he died and resurrected. So they became late. Their names were not registered in the front line. But they lived, grew up with him. If possible, if, if, even perhaps they ate together in the same bowl. They might have even slept on the same bed. They lied with the anointing but woke up without none. They wrapped themselves on the anointing and caught none. You know, life is so interesting that sometimes you may not value what is close to you. Then you'll be looking far away. It is said that the grass looks greener when it is far. So in your church, you have your pastor. 
but you are eyeing another pastor. You do not see that the one with you has the anointing. We saw it throughout scripture. People, some people who were close to the anointing, some missed it. Some were saved. Even if you think about Jacob and Esau, they were living in the same house of the one who carried the promise from Abraham. Yet one, if you read the story carefully, you realize that Esau, one of the reasons why he lost was that he was not paying attention to his parents. But Jacob stayed at home, took instruction. Who are you? Are you like this? You know, sometimes in the church, some people are waiting for the rapture to happen, for them to, to believe that Jesus will come soon. You want it to happen before you wake up. I pray for you that you will recognize that Jesus is sitting by you right now wherever you are. That you will recognize that Jesus is listening to you even now as you pray. You will recognize that Jesus is close by. I pray that God will open your eye that when it matters most, you'll be able to identify your Savior who is with you. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. The next group of people are the Marys. I call them the Mary series. The Marys and the Salomes. Amen. Amen. Which Marys am I talking about? I'm talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Then there's another Mary described as the other Mary. Then we have the Salome. That's a group of females who had worked with Jesus in his ministry. The first Mary, the mother of Mary, from the time, the mother of Jesus, from the time the prophecy came to her through the angel, had followed the development of his son Jesus to the point that she believed that the son is special. So when the son was at a wedding in Canaan where she was also present and there was shortage of wine, we were told that Mary went and told his son that they don't have wine. And when she was standing away, she told the servants there that what Whatever he tells you, do it. Whatever he tells you, do it. Why? Because she believed in the Son. Hallelujah. Now, if you study again scripture carefully, you realize that even though Mary was not in the front line of the ministry of her son, she followed the events to the extent that she was at the cross when the son was going to breathe his last. And so Jesus, seeing the mother at the cross, with John, the disciple he loved, he told the disciple he loved, this is your mother, and he told the mother, this is your son. So Mary was able to stand with the son even at difficult times. What no mother can face is to see the dying of his son. When my mother was alive, one of the prayers she will always pray is that she wants to die before us. She doesn't want to see any of her children die. But Mary was able to stay. Together with the other women, they endured. At the time when the men were nowhere to be found. But they were there. Who are you? Are you there for Jesus? Are you ready to sacrifice your all for Jesus? When the going becomes tough, will you be there? When it mattered most, will you rise up? Will you be counted among the people? I pray for you that God will give you the grace to stand like Mary, the mother of Jesus, to the end that you may have the crown of life. Hallelujah. 
The next group is Peter and John. Peter and John are a very interesting character. They were with Jesus throughout his ministry. Apparently, they were about the first group that were selected. Peter was the unofficial spokesman for the group. And John was Jesus' beloved. We saw them in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we saw Peter demonstrate his loyalty to his master by taking his sword to cut off the ear of Clopas. That's to show that, look, I am ready to fight for my master. Now, if you study carefully, you see that these two had also traveled together with their master Jesus to Anna's house, to the high priest's house, to Pilate's place. It was there that Peter encountered the challenges and denied his master three times. But, you know, he overcame it and went on. On the resurrection morning, they were the first to enter the, 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 the grave. When Mary Magdalene told them the story, we were told that they ran to the tomb. And Peter overtook, John overtook Peter first, but Peter, when he got to the tomb, entered and saw the, the, the empty tomb. So among the cluster of men and disciples, these two are the ones that can be distinguished. They are the only people who can tell the story of Jesus from its beginning to its end. They are the only people who can tell the story about Jesus' trial. They are the only people who can tell the story about the empty tomb. They are the only people who can tell the story. No wonder on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached the sermon and 3,000 souls were won. No wonder Jesus could say that you are Peter, but on this rock, I will build my church. No wonder it was in the life of Peter and John that the first notable miracle took place after Jesus' death. You remember the story in Acts chapter 3 when they were entering the temple and the cripple met them and they said, Silver and gold have we not, but that which we have, indeed that which they had, because they were with Jesus. They were sure they have him. And said, the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. These are people who rub themselves on the anointing and caught it. These are people who lived by the anointing and believed in it. These are people who touched the anointing and, and received it. So Peter will write later, that which we have seen and touched, we, to we told you. Oh, hallelujah. How I pray that you too can give a testimony like that. That which I see, that which I touch, I tell you. They are the feely, feely believers. They are people who, because of what they have seen and what they have experienced, whipping could not take them off. You remember the story where they were whipped for preaching Jesus. They told the, 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 the persecutors. Whom should we listen to? To you or to God? You see, when you, when you act actively beside an anointing, something comes upon you. A certain spirit comes upon you that is indestructible. Something comes upon you. The nature of your master takes you over. You become bold like a lion. I pray for you that you will be bold like that. Hallelujah. You know, the big difference between this and those who sit beside the anointing and do not believe is that they, when the opportunity came, they took it. When people were in doubt and Jesus asked, whom do people say that I am? And he asked, who do you say I am? It took Peter. 
to say you are the son of the living God. You will make the right confessions. When it matters most, you will make the right confessions. You, you will move at the right time. When Jesus talks, again, look at Peter and John. It was their boat that Jesus used to preach. And then he told them, let down your net. And when they did, they caught plenty fish. It was Peter who said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. But at your word, I will let down the net. It means that Peter had a certain disposition, a disposition of obedience in, her, in, her, in his lowliness, in her semi-educatedness. When he saw anointing, he was able to identify it. May you be able to identify anointing and take advantage of it in Jesus Christ's name. Mm -hmm. The last character, which for me is the star in all that I'm discussing, is Mary Magdalene. She, she got the cup, the final cup. If you look through the Gospels, you realize that Mary Magdalene was the one out of whom Jesus had cast, cast demons out. Mary Magdalene also looked like the woman who was tagged and called the harlot. Mary Magdalene was the woman who was not respected. She was a woman without honor. Mary Magdalene looked like the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and with her hair. Mary Magdalene. Since she came into contact with Jesus, she came to Jesus because of her troubles. She was not appointed like Peter and John. She brought herself. And what brought her to Jesus? Her problems. Her problems were many. It was about Mary Magdalene that Jesus said that to him who much is given, much is required. She understood that the Lord has spent much on her. And she was ready to give her all to her master. Besides all other things that she did. You know, she was at the... At Golgotha, where Jesus hung on the cross. And when all other people were gone home, were told on the first day of the week, early in the morning before they broke, she woke up and went to the tomb. Now, because sometimes we have read the story over and over again, you can imagine it. This is a woman I'm talking about who naturally would have been afraid of a ghost, who naturally would have been afraid of the night. But she threw away the fear because of her love for her master, because of her love for the anointed person. And interestingly, she could have called somebody to go with her to the tomb, but she went alone. What was she looking for? For Mary Magdalene, the love of Jesus has no beginning and no end. Even in death, her love was constant. So she went to the tomb. Whether you are dead or not, I am willing to associate myself with you. Whether people are laughing and teasing, whether people have any reason to believe in you or not, for me, I have believed. As far as I'm concerned, I have no other argument. In life, in death, I am yours. So she got to the tomb, and we're told that Mary was the first to know of the resurrection. Who oh, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. No apostle, no man of God. You know, sometimes when... We, we think that we are men of God and we are holding our shoulders up. <laughs> the, the revelation of the resurrection that we are celebrating was discovered by a lowly woman. A lowly woman. A no-respected woman. A woman who never came into the picture. A non-suspected woman whose faith was solid. Who had added to her faith Love, oh yes, 
her love for her master. So when he entered and saw that Jesus' body was not in the temple, we were told that she ran back to tell Peter and John. And they ran into to the tomb. And when they did not find the body of Jesus, we were told that they left. But she remained. It is an anointing you have to catch. The remaining anointing, anointing to be able to wait, is an anointing you must catch. Oh, shout amen, somebody. Amen. Yes, she stayed. The men were gone. The place was lonely. The Roman soldiers had abandoned the place. They were confused. But one woman stayed there and she cried. What was she crying about? I want to see my master dead or alive. I am ready to pay any price. Show me where my master is. We were told that as she was crying, she bent down to look into the tomb again. Why? Because she has hope that it will be well again. Even though I did not see him, he will come back. That was faith. So Mary Magdalene had faith. Mary Magdalene had love. Mary Magdalene had endurance. And Mary Magdalene loved the Lord with her emotions. Oh, yes. She poured her tears. She stayed at the tomb. And when you love the Lord like this, with all your life, God will not pass you by. He will reveal himself to you. So as he looked into the tomb once again, he saw the two angels. And they asked him, whom are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my master, Jesus. I don't know where they have taken him to. And he said, and he, she made a very interesting proclamation. When she turned, the Bible said she saw Jesus. But she didn't recognize Jesus early. Then he spoke to the man. He, he took the man to be the gardener. I said, are you the one who has removed my, my master? Show me where you took him so that I'll go and carry him. Oh, hallelujah. Now, Jesus had been in the tomb for three days. And Mary Magdalene is saying that you show me even his rotting body is okay for me. Now, can you also ask yourself this question? Could Mary Magdalene alone carry a dead man? Yet she was ready because of her love. She was ready because of her faith. She was ready because of her commitment. Oh, for me, she carried the day. She carried the star. Hallelujah. And I pray that God will give me and give you this grace that was on Mary Magdalene. Where the men could not go, she went. Where the people with titles. You know, Mary Magdalene is not called an apostle. But she by her deed brought apostleship on the people. Mary Magdalene was not called an apostle, but she carried the message that go and tell my brothers to wait for me in Jerusalem. Go and tell them. Mary Magdalene's carried the message. Mary Magdalene's are not ashamed. Mary Magdalene's are not afraid as far as Jesus is concerned. Who are you? I pray that this Easter and this Sunday, you would be a Mary Magdalene. If we have five of Mary Magdalene in any church, the church will be different. There are people who can stand up for the truth. There are people who will not be afraid of the faces of people. They will be, there are people who are carried by the passion they have for Jesus. For them, Jesus in his dead and rotten form is still better than the world. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord strengthen you that you'll be able to identify who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for these lessons you have taught us. Our prayer today
is that help us to be better persons than we are today. May we be like Mary Magdalene and better. That when it mattered most, you can rely upon us. For as Mary Magdalene, even in Jesus' death, was willing to stay by the tomb, so also we too should be willing to stay at the tomb and to receive the total and the final glory. May we be part of the revelation of your glory. May we be the first to herald your glory to the world. Lord, help us to tarry in your presence. And as we tarry, reveal yourself to us. We give you praise, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now, we want to thank God for what he's doing. And we pray that he will continue to strengthen us. Remember, as we say every Sunday, that you observe the social distance and keep the protocols that have been given to us until this difficult period is over. May the Lord keep you. Shall we take the benediction? And now may the resurrected Jesus reveal himself to you May the resurrected Jesus speak to you. May the Lord Jesus, who resurrected on the third day from the grave, give you a message for the world. And may you be like Mary Magdalene, who will spread that good news. Go with the power of the touch of Jesus. Go with the revelation of the power of Jesus upon your life. And may everything you touch be blessed. May you be the miracle worker. May you be the healer. May you be the salvation preacher. In the name of Jesus, the peace of the Lord Almighty rests and abide with you all. Amen. Amen.